Welcome to New York Bio's virtual breakfast series, a digital program started in 2020, bringing you fireside chats with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. This week's episode brings us Shalini Vallabhan and Alice Lynn Pomponio of the American Cancer Society's Cancer Action Network. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hawks Bland, and I am the CEO at New York Bio. We're thrilled you're joining us for another installment of our virtual breakfast series. This morning, we are very lucky to have two representatives from the American Cancer Society, Cancer Action Network, as well as Bright Edge, their venture fund. Um, so with Shalini and Alice today, we're going to um, not only talk about developments in cancer research, but also access and patients. And that ties in really well with our theme this month as we lead up to our patient engagement summit. Um, a special thank you goes out to Pfizer who is sponsoring um, four weeks of our virtual breakfast series as we really focus on patients and not only their journey, but their place in helping us develop therapeutics and treatments. So with that, as always, everyone, I should record this and just hit the button every week. Um, remember <laughs> your, your questions you know, either in the chat or the Q&A box. Um, so please put them in there as we have our conversation with Shalini and Alice, and we will get to them as we can. Um, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to Derek to introduce our two esteemed guests. Okay, good morning, Shalini and Alice. It's wonderful to have both of you here. Uh, we're excited for our patient engagement summit next week, and I think both of you representing the, uh, the Cancer Action Network from the American Cancer Society is, is just a great episode to have now in, uh, in the run-up to what we're going towards. So we like to start with a bit of, uh, with a bit of an origin story for all of our guests to uh, let everyone know a bit where he came from. So Shalini, why don't we start with you? Can you kind of let everybody know really kind of how you got to where you are today? Sure. Well, good morning, uh, everyone, and thank you, Jennifer, Derek, and New York Bio for having Alice and I uh, join you this morning. We're, I know we're both excited to be here with you. When Derek asked me to do Origin Story, I was first thinking like something like Marvel Comics or X-Men, but really, <laughs> you know, um, in essence, I, I came from a family or I come from a family of engineers and healthcare providers. And so thinking about health and healthcare, as well as um, trying to understand kind of fundamental uh, structures and how things work has always been a part of my life. And then uh, back in high school, I fell in love with studying uh, about the American government system in my civics class. And that took me to graduate school and um, after graduate school, I decided to just uh, throw myself into policy making and I came to Washington DC, worked on Congress for a few years and then joined the American Cancer Society. And now I've been with the society for about 15 years, over two tours of duty. And the, I guess one thing I wanted to highlight for for everyone is that the American Cancer Society, one of the many things that I love about it is that it really um, looks at the evidence base for determining certainly what policies we advocate on the ACS CAN side, the Cancer Action Network, but all of our research information programs overall. So I was at the society and then I had an opportunity to do some global health work. And eventually I just decided to take the leap and move and live in Asia and work on public health issues, really reducing tobacco use and improving access to care, but particularly with a focus on palliative care. And then back in 2013 is when I had the privilege really, that's how I feel about it, to join the American Cancer Society again this time with the Cancer Action Network. And uh, I'll, I'll pause there and I'm just thrilled to be here. That's great, thank you. So uh, Alice, you too, it'd be great to hear a little bit more about your background and a little bit about Bright Edge. Sure, well, Derek and Jennifer, it's really great to be here with our 
New York cousins. I'm on the board of Mass Bio, so I definitely know um, you all, and, and we, we've collaborated in the past. I wish my story were as um, straightforward as Shalini's, uh, because I have done a number of pivots throughout my career. I'm a daughter of the biotech industry, trained as a molecular biologist, but quickly pivoted more to really just the system level issues. I was constantly distracted, to be honest, you know, from the lab. And after finishing, you know, an undergrad at MIT, I ended up going to the Kennedy School and, and spending quite a bit of time in policy. My first career was in uh, biopharma industry, science and healthcare policy. But really today, uh, I would say that I just identify as an impact innovator. I am pretty agnostic as to how we achieve impact. And so when you think of the first 25 years in biopharma, I was at places like Genzyme CNFE, where I helped to get orphan drug legislation passed in multiple markets, um, AstraZeneca helping take their R&D organization into an open innovation format, working on um, alternative clinical trial designs, um, bioethics, and then even at startup companies like Radius Health launching, you know, Part D self-injectable products. I feel like, you know, as our industry was growing, I was really on the front lines, just trying to get science out there, trying to mm -hmm. shape the environment so we could make sure that, you know, discovery got from bench to bedside. And um, in 2009, my world got rocked because um, sadly, my mother passed away from undiagnosed colon cancer um, that could have easily been caught and treated with standard mm -hmm. of care. But, you know, here she was with two daughters in healthcare, and um, she didn't seek any care. She was terrified of what it would cost. And three years later, my father is diagnosed with follicular lymphoma. He receives combination treatment and he's a survivor to this day. So it just highlighted for me mm -hmm. that we are in this really crazy moment in time where we have amazing scientific advancements and life-saving treatments. But even in you know my own lived experience, we have tremendous disparities and inequities. And so that really forced me to question whether I was innovating you know, towards the right kind of goals and just being someone who, you know, doesn't take no for an answer and thinks three dimensionally. Um, I was like, well, policy has been a really great kind of impact innovation as well as help pave way for innovations. But are we really innovating towards an agenda that is going to make our um, sector and healthcare sustainable in the long run? And so that brought me to thinking mm -hmm. about, you know, what is the role of sort of policy, but also entrepreneurial solutions and technology. And so in some ways, I kind of came out of the medicine cabinet, if you will. And I decided, you know, mm -hmm. let's start innovating in the areas of greatest need. Let's really take the best and brightest minds and think of entrepreneurial solutions. And so that brought me more to design thinking, human centered design, patient centricity. I started teaching at MIT. And then all along, I knew that you know, we also had a breakdown in the capital markets where a lot of these types of innovations were being completely looked past and looked over by our traditional VCs. So when American Cancer Society had asked me, um, and by the way, I had been volunteering for American Cancer Society um, for the past four years, mostly because I needed to be whole. I needed to have an outlet yeah. to be able to do something at that you know, patient level, and it brought me closer to prevention and to um, access and universal health care coverage and all the things that, quite honestly, when we as industry lobbyists, um, while we would like to, you know, we just are really there to represent our scientific portfolio, our patient segment. And so it didn't have that comprehensiveness that I was looking for. Um, and with Bright Edge, I think we have a really unique moment in time because, you know, if we believe that you know, there is just as much validity behind needs-based design as there is discovery-based design, meaning stuff coming out of research and brand new novel, yay. But oh, by the way, let's really go back and understand what are those pressing problems? What are still unmet needs? And then what might be solutions? How do we bring, you know, interdisciplinary research together? How do we fuel those enterprises? And if healthcare is a public-private nonprofit play, American Cancer Society is really uniquely positioned because we have delivered, you know, programs through our charitable funded organization. We have lobbied 
you know, it, through Shalini's organization for the public sector to do the right thing. And now Bright Edge, which we can talk more about, is really well positioned to do that, working with and through the for-profit uh, private sector. Yeah. So just as a just as a little bit of of background, so Bright Edge is now the uh, the venture fund, which is is reasonably young, correct? It's a reasonably new creation out of the uh, American Cancer Society, and um, it's if I if I have it correctly, it's a, it's an evergreen philanthropic fund, right? And uh, so, can you talk a little bit about kind of where the fund likes to play in the in the investment spectrum? So, what kind of investor uh, is Bright Edge? Is this on the really early side of the equation, are you, you know, do do you guys play in some kind of larger Series A rounds? What are the the types of investments that the fund likes to make? Yeah, well, thanks for asking. And it is still very early days, so you're absolutely correct. Today, Bright Edge is a, and we would say it's a philanthropic impact fund because we would like to see ourselves as an attractive okay. impact investment. We are donor funded today, but over time, you know, that may change just given the vibrancy of the investment marketplace. Um, but we are also, you know, aiming to be an intentional impact investor, right? Mm -hmm. So if American Cancer Society has probably unparalleled knowledge of what are the drivers of mortality from cancer, you know, we also know what are the persistent unmet needs. And then on top of that, you know, what solutions might be. And I think with Bright Edge, um, you know, early on, we invested late just because we needed to get in and get out. And so we did a couple yep. of Series C and D deals. Um, during COVID, things were very lean. And so we invested more at the early stages at the seed level and A. I would say typically, you know, we are going to be an early stage player because there is just so much coming down the pipe. Um, we have ACS affiliated research as well. We have some of the most rigorous scientific review for our grant funding. Five billion invested in cancer research since the society's founding, 49 Nobel laureates. Surely some of that science or some of those individuals have gone on to found companies. <laughs> and yep. we, you know, want to now be able to fuel and propel that next generation of, you know, research entrepreneurs. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it really is a question of how can ACS best um, leverage our very precious donor dollars to make the biggest impact. So going back to what is, you know, the scientific gap, what's the innovation gap, what's the uh, marketplace gap where ACS can really, you know, mobilize our intellectual and social capital to make a difference. And so if it's early stage, you know, more discovery based opportunities, Opportunities, we believe we can bring late stage thinking to early stage product design to help de-risk, to help accelerate. You know, if it's a company that's really operating in a, trans, a, a transformative space, we like to say practice changing, paradigm shifting, you know, a very known trusted brand mm -hmm. like ACS can bring the level of market awareness that's needed. And we can couple that with the population science, our public health know-how, and really help companies see around the corner you know, also help the, the crossover rounds and the public investor have confidence in this yep. solution being not only vetted, but also that we've brought some of that wisdom into the product design, you know, thinking about patient centricity early, thinking about system level solutions. Um, and so just an example would be, you know, we, we are here to accelerate our broader mission of reducing cancer mortality by 40% by 2035. And that's going to be at all angles, at all levels. And so access to, let's even say screening post pandemic is a real mm -hmm. issue. One of our companies, um, Freenome is a blood based, you know, cancer uh, screening technology for colorectal cancer. You know, it mm -hmm. could, like all of the other, you know, blood based screening programs, provide much broader access mm -hmm. to patients who then don't have to go in to hospital or inpatient settings. Um, it can uh, do so, you know, with a very different cost equation. And so, you know, a, a solution like that would be, it really exemplifies how we think about, you know, not only the role of diagnostics, the role of broader access, the role of new technologies, but anticipating what a future state of healthcare could look like. And that's where ACS's Bright Edge should be playing moving forward. And, and then that's fantastic. That's really terrific. And go ahead, Jennifer. Oh, I was just going to say, and then thinking about sort of, I feel like that's one end of the spectrum, right? And then mm -hmm. thinking about access to care, like you said, like your mother didn't 
like she was worried that she couldn't afford whatever they would find, right? It was this fear of, of, of finding out and then dealing with those consequences. Shalini, what are the biggest challenges that you all have faced? And let's exclude COVID for right now. I feel like we're gonna put that in a parking lot and talk about it separately. Yep. Um, we'll get there. <laughs> that sounds good. Yes. Let's put it in a parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> right, over, over here. Um, and then what are the challenges you're seeing as far as advocating for access, not only to treatments, but to Alice's point, to diagnostics, to, to be able to detect earlier? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so let me take a step back and kind of give that big picture perspective on CAN and then address the specific question on access. So ACS Cancer Action Network is um, our advocacy and a public policy affiliate of the American Cancer Society. We're two separate organizations, but I think of it as we are the organization where the strategy for the Cancer Society to advance public policies. And we have three broad policy priorities at the current time, and they're big buckets. So the first bucket I would say is accelerating research and innovation. Second is improving access to care, to your point in question. And third is preventing cancer and primarily focusing on uh, reducing tobacco use. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of other quick pieces to just share with you in the in the audience, foundational to all three of those areas is our commitment to advancing health equity. So, you know, certainly over the past year, this is a topic that has, you know, I think entered the mainstream in terms of addressing health inequities and keeping a, a North Star on health equity. By design, the ACS CAN has always focused on health equity, but I think now we're much more purposeful to just say, and I, I, I like to say that we're, we're a little bit greedy in that we want innovation to continue. We want what we're seeing with um, personalized medicine to be, to expand to more and more patients at the same time access, if, if patients can't have access to those uh, diagnostics, biomarker testing, how can we then deploy the appropriate personalized medicine for that particular patient? Right. Yep. And that is really what is driving ACS CAN. I would say within access, it really is too broad areas. One is that we know if that if an individual is uninsured mm -hmm. compared to someone that has health insurance, they are more likely to be diagnosed with advanced cancer, mm -hmm. which is more deadly and more costly. And so we that's kind of the, the fuel and the passion that drives us. Couple other elements I wanted to highlight, uh, and Alice knows the story well. As she mentioned, she was a volunteer with the ACS and ACS CAN. I always like to say we have we have really great staff at ACS and ACS CAN. But the truth of the matter is, is that our power comes from volunteers. We have so ACS CAN has a nationwide volunteer network. We have a trained volunteer that kind of heads up each of the, that represents um, all 435 congressional districts and all 50 states. And we work with these volunteers on an ongoing basis so that they are the voice, the patient voice, the caregiver's voice, even the provider and the researcher. And then the third element about CAN I wanted to highlight is, and we've already talked to about this to a certain degree, whether we're a nonprofit organization or a private sector biotech, we can't do this alone. These are big, complicated opportunities. I like to think of it as an opportunity. And so ACS CAN convenes stakeholders from life sciences, healthcare systems, 
and public health to really look at what's on the horizon. Where are we finding challenges to deliver what we know already works? And what are the challenges and opportunities we see, just as an example, in life sciences? What's working well to keep that ecosystem strong? And what are we seeing as challenges? Um, one thing I wanted to mention for everyone is that we have our national forum happening on April 27th. This is our 10th annual forum. And, you know, like all of us, I guess a silver lining to a small silver lining to COVID is that this is a virtual event and it's happening on April 27th. The theme of the event is breaking barriers to cancer care for all cancer patients. So we have uh, Dr. Marcella Nunes Smith, who is the chair of the Biden administration's Health Equity Task Force. She's delivering the keynote speech. And um, we have three panels. And one of the panels in particular, or all three panels, will be interesting. One is to ensure that we're breaking down barriers to those new therapies and new technologies. How can, you know, who's doing that well? What are the challenges around that? Secondly, it's again, breaking barriers down to participating in clinical trials. And finally, and we will never lose our focus on this as Alice mentioned earlier, we have to still push cancer prevention and cancer screening, because we all know that that is the, you know, there's so much we can do right now with what the tools that we have at our disposal. And so we need to continue to ensure that that access is made better and that we can reduce disparities. And I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to also say, not only do we work closely with Shalini on government affairs issues, but Julie Hart, who is your ACS CAN government Absolutely. affairs director in New York, is amazing and does an amazing job for you all and for the entire community of patients. Absolutely. I mean, issues like um, any kind of policies around fail first policies, step therapy, prior authorization, um, we are asking that these processes be fair and transparent. Yeah for the patient's benefit, and, and Julie is terrific. Yeah, yeah we okay, just I'll had just, someone on I'll just on say that as a, as a former volunteer and someone who, again, advocated on behalf of the industry, um, ACS CAN is just in a league of their own. You know, the, the lobby day down on Capitol Hill, and I've been to many a bio, you know, fly-in day, you will yeah. have never seen mm -hmm. anything like the cancer lobby day with over 800 once COVID is passed 800 but grassroots volunteers approaching every member of congress talking about everything from soup to nuts prevention to survivorhood for cancer and i think the authenticity of acs can in that it is patient focused in everything they do sure ama bio aha can walk up yeah. but a legislator knows that mm -hmm. once acs can has its eye on a particular piece of legislation it is absolutely you know committed to doing what's right for patients and with that i i encourage you know even new york bio members to volunteer every now and then just to get a taste of what acs can does absolutely and having been um having been a hill staffer for an appropriations member <laughs> i am very familiar <laughs> with the lobbying power <laughs> those blue shirts i know when they come up yeah <laughs> and i can't hide <laughs> Well, we had a uh, we had a patient on this on this program last week uh, talk about uh, her you know tribulations with step therapy and you know making making those policies actually you know closer to the patient and work for the patient is incredibly important. Um, Alice, you said something before that that I wanted to come back to because I think this really kind of hits on a lot of the things that we're talking about. You talked a little bit about uh, your background in design and in patient centric thinking and. You know, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how we may want to think about some of these challenges from really the standpoint of, of the patient and think about how we, you know, implement, you know, design style tactics into something like, you know, increasing prevention or increasing access? 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, um, I realized, I, I would say about 10 years ago that, you know, the, the term patient centricity and patient centered design were being used interchangeably, but they actually mean mm -hmm. very different things. And mm -hmm. quite honestly, they will, you know, overlap in some cases, but they could easily diverge, mm -hmm. you know, because a patient centered product means you incorporate great patient insights and you put together the ad boards and, you know, in some ways you do your best to optimize that product design with, you know, patient inputs, but mm -hmm. a highly effective, very personalized, you know, cutting edge fourth and, you know, class product mm -hmm. may not necessarily, especially if a patient can't access it, may not be the same as, you know, a patient centric innovation agenda where patients really want to set their own health goal. They want to avoid getting sick to begin with. You know, they may actually mm -hmm. want to um, stage their care in different ways, depending on life events. You know, quality of life is important to them. And so, you know, I would just encourage us to really be really kind of, again, intentional and mindful of whether or not our innovations are towards patient centricity. Um, are we optimizing patient centeredness? And one of the key things is, you know, absolutely to do some of this design thinking early. I think um, the policy successes are phenomenal, but they are quite late, right? Like, why didn't we anticipate, you know, some of these disruptive technologies early enough so that we didn't have to wait until patients were vehemently, you know, crying out for help because they couldn't get access. Lives were lost during that period of time mm -hmm. when we didn't anticipate that new technologies were coming and we didn't prepare our systems to, to receive them. At the same time, I think that patients desperately want to, we have data, they want to be engaged, they want to be part of the decision making and they wanna drive their care. Well, honestly, we have a humanitarian crisis in that patients aren't given tools to be able to do that in today's healthcare system. Um, and that ranges from health literacy to understanding, you know, the disease, their own uh, genetic makeup, their own predisp predisposition to disease, risk response, drug response. You know, all of these things are really, um, unfortunately, the, the innovator industry is burdened with basically doing that system level upgrade. And what we need to do is actually flip it around so that we're all clear on what would be, you know, the path forward for patient centric care. It doesn't even have to be health care. Actually, it should be patient centric health, you know, because that would be the goal first. And then, yep. you know, where can we uh, collaborate to, um, to, to, to identify what are the most viable, impactful solutions, and then how do we uh, work to really ensure that companies developing those solutions are um, accelerated, fueled, put in positions for, for growth. Um, and honestly, I think, you know, what, what I was very surprised with when I came to ACS as a volunteer is that the disease foundations are actually great solution architects. Like they are the ones who are closest to the community yeah. health needs. And while they may not do it, you know, in a technology enabled fashion, although that will change over time, you know, even in the case of American Cancer Society, if patients can't get to their treatments, they don't have rides to get there, they can't have, they can't afford lodging to be able to, yep. you know, to, to yeah. do very rigorous treatments, they don't get better. And so the idea of providing um, support for logistics is something that the American Cancer Society did early on. We're now seeing, you know, with changes in policy that this is a reimbursable benefit. The marketplace is finally catching up, but that's a great example of where the solution was designed in the nonprofit and it really needed, you know, the, uh, the business and the enterprise formation to occur so it could scale and be more broadly available. Yeah, one of the uh, one of the big takeaways we, we see from a lot of these types of conversations is that we need to listen to patients more, and patients need to be really kind of more deeply involved in the conversation. So, uh, as we've mentioned before, we have our patient engagement summit coming up uh, next Wednesday. Uh, one of the big things that we said we were going to do uh, that we have done is that we've put patients on every single one of our panels. Uh, which I realize is a small step, but it's something where we want to make sure that those voices are heard front and center and that we actually give patients a forum uh, to be part of that communication. 
So, you know, Shalini, turning to you uh, for a second year, about if we're thinking about reasonably large shifts in how we think about care or to drop the care, how we think about patient health, you know, what are some of the ways that, you know, need to be communicated if we have to take something along the lines of, you know, greater prevention or, or things that really kind of shift the paradigm of how we think about the way that we either look at diagnoses or the way that we actually think about testing? You know, what are some of the major kind of communication efforts that need to happen either on a policy level or on a patient level uh, to make sure there's better understanding around that? Okay, so I think I understand the question. Um, Sorry, I did that thing where I ask three questions. <laughs> yes, I apologize. Just, just answer what you want to. <laughs> Pick one. They're all interesting. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I think when we're looking at any, let me let me think about um, and look at cancer disparities. When you're looking at those types of issues, certainly what's the barriers or the causes of those disparities are multifactorial. So you can have either a policy issue, um, there can be bias, systemic bias in the system itself. Um, there can be a lack of diversity of providers and professionals that are providing that care, et cetera. And then, then we, we can also look at the social determinants of health, et cetera. And ACS, American Cancer Society, and ACS CAN recognizes this truth and this um, situation. So recently, ACS CAN has um, partnered with the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, NCCN, and the National Minority Quality Forum to take on a project that is identifying recommendations for um, Congress, but it's really recommendations for our community overall and um, to elevate cancer equity. So it's really looking at the health equity issues, but really zeroing in on what's the cancer story. And those recommendations, um, part, part of the process to inform that project, we did uh, surveys of both patients and providers to better understand kind of perceptions of bias at both level. And, and lo and behold, and not surprising to anyone here, there is uh, differences in how patients perceive the level of care, the quality of care that they receive based on their race and ethnicity. And providers even recognize that they may have in, unintentionally had some bias at play. And so we need, we know this, and so what can we do to move it forward? So that requires efforts that will address the health system itself to help build capacity, uh, to address where there may be bias, and how can we diversify that workforce, as well as policy recommendations. You know, one of the things that we really recognized through this project is that we have guidelines that have, help inform the delivery of cancer care from prevention, diagnoses, treatment, and follow-up care. So we want to share, uh, shine a spotlight on encouraging all of us, again, irrespective of who the patient is, to deliver that guideline con concurrent care. And so we're very excited about this. We are sharing findings with congressional leaders uh, in mid-April. Those recommendations, like I said, some are policy, some are health systems, community engagement, and um, and that's what's gonna, it's gonna take. It's gonna have to take kind of a multi-pronged focus and we will never let our focus up on this to address and, and really reduce cancer disparities. I mean, this is a big question. <laughs> it's broad. Um, how, how, do we, how do we get people into cancer screenings or whether it's a diagnostic for something specific or more general screenings in the communities in which they receive care already. 
So is it is it the pharmacy that they see? Because not everyone has a general practitioner and not everyone certainly goes for specialty checkups, right? They receive care in different places. How do we crack that nut, if you will? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we advocate for the National Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program at the CDC. This is a program um, that was designed and developed to really provide access to breast cancer screening for low uh, income, medically underserved women. Um, so that program has been going on for several years. And through that history, it was finally recognized that, well, it's not enough to guarantee access to screening. If we find cancer or we find questionable um, yeah. cases, they must have access to that follow-up uh, diagnostic and treatment. Th those programs are really um, delivered in a variety of settings. They can be community health centers. Um, yeah. And really those FQHCs, those federally qualified health centers are really on the front lines, particularly for kind of medically underserved communities. Yeah. You know, I just asked uh, a colleague of mine uh, this question, like, what happens? How are we getting people into the system? Because we know that if you're, if you are diagnosed, say, with a non-small cell lung cancer, at some point you need that biomarker testing. Yeah. So how are, how does it work for people who may be in Medicaid or who are uninsured or medically underserved. And, and, I, and I asked a colleague that's in the healthcare system, in a healthcare system, and he was like, this is a great question. And it forced him to kind of look at it and see how their system looks at this issue. And, it's, and it won't surprise you, it looks like a plate of spaghetti. And it's only, and it's only if you're some, if you're lucky, really, yeah. that you can get into that system and the system is prepared to take either charity care or uncompensated care. But also going back to my earlier point, saying we need to follow the guidelines and provide that care. Uh, the unfortunate part of what the question you asked is that most people, if they don't have meaningful health insurance, if they don't have access to healthcare delivery system, right. they're gonna be delayed. There could be delayed getting that screening. Mm -hmm. uh, and then certainly there, there are the delays that could happen with getting the follow-up diagnostics and then on onto therapies. And so it's complicated, but we've got to, we've got to look at these issues uh, with a sense of urgency that I think uh, I haven't seen before actually in my career. And, um, and that makes me excited because like I said, we're greedy. <laughs> we want those innovations to continue. Um, we want new therapy, new targeted therapies, new immunotherapies. Um, but we, we know, all of us know that the, we need to have the right patient at the right time to deliver the right yeah. diagnostics and therapy. And if that time piece is not addressed, you know, then why are we doing this? Yeah. yeah. So Alice, you had, you had mentioned kind of the last mile problem before, right? If, if patients can't get to, uh, if, if they can't even get to the place where they're going to get treatment, the treatment doesn't happen. And, you know, as a fund in life sciences, they, they, most funds usually simply converge onto therapeutics, right? How do you, as a fund, really keep the balance of you know, looking at new therapeutic solutions or new platforms that could change things on you know, they could change the outcomes on a molecular level versus say, you know, what we can call kind of an infrastructure play or something else that, you know, helps with a different part of the, uh, of, 
of the the chain of care, so to speak. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that's a tough question because today we are a small fund, although we're growing and we have ambitions mm -hmm. to really achieve that broader system level transformation that, you know, has been demonstrated within the society and, and that ACS CAN has been able to do. You know, when you think about some of the policy successes ACS CAN has delivered on, on behalf of cancer patients, it's actually benefited healthcare more broadly. Yeah. And there's no reason why we couldn't see that same sort right. of opportunity within the investment landscape. But today we are cancer focused. And so that is why a lot of our investments do gravitate towards um, cancer specific therapeutic diagnostic companies. You know, of course, platform companies that may or may go towards cancer or, you know, very novel um, target identification that is considering whether cancer would be a indication um, at first pass. We, we, that's a, great time for ACS Bright Edge to get involved. Um, but I, I think what Shalini mentioned earlier about the last mile problem, well, how, why can't we bring that knowledge and those insights earlier, right? And design mm -hmm. around them. And so yeah. just as um, we, we had talked about the policy solutions, quite honestly, in many of those cases, those were all um, initiated and grounded in amazing evidence. So we have, you know, through the Cancer Society, the um, the Cancer Atlas, which shows that, you know, depending on um, social demographic, age, uh, proximity to radiation centers, to hospitals, um, access to insurance coverage, like we can see the difference in cancer patient outcomes, <laughs> and it's mm -hmm. all laid out. And so why wouldn't we harness that knowledge earlier, you know, identify particular populations that are most at risk. And keep in mind that there are, is tremendous disparity across even the cancer types, right? You know, breast, thyroid, well above the five-year mortality, you know, um, outcomes, whereas um, below average are sadly pancreatic, um, lung cancer, you know, and so we have tremendous work to still do there. And it, one way to sort of reduce that disparity, even among the cancer types, is to be going really early, thinking really mm -hmm. hard about the toughest cancer biology opportunities. So pan cancer, tissue agnostic, anything that we can do to really, you know, ideally understand and prevent, but if not, you know, have agents that can treat the broadest um, set of cancers, that would be ideal you know, to have confidence that um, these products are being developed with all of the patients in mind. So diversity in clinical trials is so important because then patients can have confidence that mm -hmm. they're, you know, that, that they were represented in the development and commercialization of those products. And, and then that gets to the quality of cancer care, right? That, you know, there could be technology solutions that almost democratize healthcare access from a quality standpoint. So we don't have to rely on patients going to academic teaching hospitals to get next gen sequencing, that they can have, right. you know, virtual tumor boards and access to key opinion leaders in rural America, you know, in Navajo Nation. Um, but why wouldn't we encourage companies at the earliest stage to design solutions with those goals in mind, with the intent of trying to achieve health equity. Um, so that again, we are innovating towards the sustainability agenda and we're trying to, wherever possible, reduce these gaps. Yeah, we Do you think have a, um, I was just gonna say in New York, we, we have the, the beauty, right, of having an extremely diverse population, particularly within, within New York City. And New York Bio um, is working on, we have a, um, a equity, diversity, and inclusion task force, and we're looking at things. And one of our pillars or buckets, depending on, uh, is, is looking at um, health equity, both access, but also um, diversity in clinical trials. And we have um, a representative from the New York City Health and Hospitals, right, on our task force. And they do a lot of clinical trial work within their, right, within the hospital setting. And it's been interesting to hear their experience of running the trials and working with the sponsors. Um, and I think it's increasing. I think companies are more and more looking on the front end to ensure that they have sufficient um, diversity within their trials for all of the reasons that you said. So I think we're getting there. I think it's slower than a lot would have liked, but I think companies are starting to really 
to make that a priority. Absolutely. You know, let's learn from our climate um, colleagues where we don't want to wait until things are mandated, right? You know, and that is the UN yeah. Sustainable Development Goals, um, principles-based business practices. Uh, we can do as much as we can through policy and hope that incentives are aligned, but if we can get the markets to actually behave in a way where these, um, these agendas, these um, ambitions are put forward and rewarded, quite honestly, I think that that is a step in in the right direction towards improving the you know whether it's the patient journey whether it's the health system resilience whether it's you know the broader population outcomes that we're trying to affect i mean all of that um will, will definitely make an impact do you think COVID has taught us anything about access you know do you think any of the things that we've we've seen here are going to stick and actually going to give us a blueprint for how to make things better well, I, I mean, is that for both of us? <laughs> Shalini, you want to take uh, Yeah, I did. <laughs> either one of you would be fine, but I'm just, I'm, I'm curious to see how both of you think of it. Well, I, I can take... Go ahead, Alice. Go ahead and I'll chime in after you. Okay. You know, I, I was just going to say that, you know, for sure we are going to witness rapid transformation of healthcare that we've all been sort of chipping away at <laughs> for decades, mm -hmm. right? You know, and that just happened overnight. I think it, it it's actually... Um, an example of just what we can do during moments of crisis, the capacity that we had for change, but we didn't act upon it. Here we were mm -hmm. where we needed to. And there there are some kind of one way doors. Like I don't think we're gonna go back to many of the sort of site specific um, approaches that we had before. So alternative, mm -hmm. um, provider methods, telehealth, I think that that is here to stay. And so, you know, fingers crossed that many of the products that are in development anticipated these types of scenarios so they can either quickly pivot or adapt, right? Because they were working on data pre-COVID, they were working on, mm -hmm. you know, healthcare archetypes and payer insights and everything else. That's yeah. completely, completely changed. Um, you know, I think that this awakening around healthcare disparities and having unmet medical needs and prioritization is also likely to be durable, I, I hope, you know, but what it's also um, done is it is going to have these silent aftershocks well into the future. So if you think breast cancer in the 40s, the survival rate was in the 20% by the 70s, it was like 40%. And here we are, you know, maybe in the upper 80%. We're, we're harnessing you know, research and discovery that was done 50 years ago. The American mm -hmm. Cancer Society actually put a pause, sadly, on our research grants for the first time in our history last year due to COVID, because, you know, our fundraising was virtually strangled. Mm -hmm. And that yep. means that our children and our grandchildren are going to feel the impacts of this, you know, belt tightening, this constriction around scientific discovery. So I would almost say we have a catch-up job to do in the labs. We have a catch-up job to do in um, the clinics in terms of screening, 90%, you know, mm -hmm. rates down. Uh, our screening rates are down by 90%. A lot of patients are not going to get their cancers caught early enough for them to have a positive outcome. We need to make, we need to do catch-up there too. And then how do we take the learnings so that we can be smarter, wiser, you know, in everything that we do moving forward. And, and I would just add, I mean, Alice hit on so many key points. Um, one that I would just put a spotlight on is around disparities and health and inequities. I, I hope that this is where we're entering a new era where, as Alice and others have talked about today, that we are really committed to ensuring that we, with a laser focus, work to reduce, in this case, cancer disparities, but health inequities overall. And I'm, I'm, I, th I agree with Alice. I'm hopeful that that will be durable and that we will continue to take that, that um, North Star, so to speak, forward. I think the second piece that COVID has taught us and we need to address moving forward is the importance of public health. Mm 
and really ensuring that we strengthen overall our public health system so that we're prepared, much more prepared um, for when we have to not only deal with uh, prevention of non-communicable diseases, but the next mm -hmm. pandemic that we face, that we're much better prepared for that. I mean, you both have significant uh, international experience. Do you kind of look at other other systems and other ways that that countries have handled things, either within their generalized public public health or or even within COVID, uh, that we can kind of perhaps you know pick and steal pieces that have worked effectively well uh, to kind of reshape the way that we think about our own system. I mean, I think from a overall perspective, I would say you can definitely point to the countries that have instituted strong public health measures at the front end to deal with COVID, to deal with the pandemic, um, as well as, but I, I, I do like to think of when, I, when we look at international and other healthcare systems, there are things to learn from all systems, including the US, and, and that there are pros and cons or things that we do well and areas that mm -hmm. we can yeah. we can do better. And the same with other systems as well. Um, I don't know, I, I'll, I'll pause there and I'll see if Alice wants to add anything. I, well, I, I would just say that, look, we're, we're a global economy. We're so interconnected. Yeah. Uh, we talked about um, the challenges around representation um, in our clinical trials. Well, there, there are nations of um, other ethnic um, and racial uh, subgroups that we could definitely you know, collaborate and work with. The, the, the notion of um, you know, designing under constraints is something that some other countries have had to do from day one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, while there's no question that the United States is a powerhouse when it comes to science, excellence, discovery, innovation, you know, I think we're ready <laughs> to do this next really hard job of designing solutions with, you know, potential constraints in mind or designing towards, you know, a multifaceted um, sort of double, triple line goal. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that is ours to, um, you know, hopefully lead and champion moving forward and not be sort of um, left in the shadows because we can't look inward and innovate and, and recreate. It's harder to make room for this type of innovation, to be honest. It's easier to go into places where there is currently no solution. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think that, you know, with groups like American Cancer Society being able to connect and convene with more interdisciplinary approaches, more focus on needs-based design, um, and being very you know, realistic about what the constraints might be moving forward, I think we can get there, absolutely. Okay, sorry. I had just uh, I was I was reading a question, but it just turned out to be a uh, a, a nice <laughs> a nice note from uh, one of our member of our audience, Stephen Stephen Chang, just said he had known you for for ages and and wanted to say he's just thrilled at thrilled at where you, <laughs> Stephen Chang, at where you ended up. Stephen I, Chang gave I, me I, my <laughs> first job in biotech, and if he's out, he's, <laughs> that's amazing. He is most. He is most definitely here. Honestly, we can we can probably have someone on this program every single week and just talk about Steve for an hour. That that seems to be how many uh, how deep Steve's network is and how many people have uh, have good stories about Steve. What I was going to say is we have so we have a few minutes left here, and you know I want you guys to think about where you would where you would like us to be from the standpoint of uh, a patient. Uh, five to 10 years from now. So five to 10 years from now, what should the, the journey look like for, uh, for a patient who's, who's going to be someone that, that ends up having cancer, whether it's, whether it's found early, what, it, what is that, what would you like that patient experience, that patient journey to look like, and how would you like it to be different from today? I'll take a swing at that. I, I hope that we have uh, by that time, some multi-cancer early detection tests that we mm -hmm. can take a simple blood test and be able to 
detect cancers early. And in the, in the case that something is found that it's a smooth process. I mean, the last, you know, when you think about uh, navigating the healthcare system, one of the things that we really see is a big need, again, with uh, when you're looking at disparities, but I think it's probably overall, is that the healthcare system is so complicated and patient navigators are key uh, need to help us navigate the system. And so I'm hoping five years from now that that navigation process is a lot simpler for patients. Um, and, you know, the holy grail in cancer is to find cancers early and to treat them at that earliest stage. The, the other aspect that I'm hoping that we will be able to address over the next few years is really the affordability of mm -hmm. cancer care and healthcare overall. Um, it was just a serious issue. I mean, there is a real financial toxicity associated with, you know, accessing healthcare services and how are we as a country going to deal with that? And I hope that that can really be addressed in a meaningful way so that you know, a cancer diagnosis is not a risk factor, not only for your health, but for your financial health. Mm -hmm. Alice? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here. So, you know, my hope in five years, seven years, is that we are using a uh, common language and common sort of impact um, framework when we talk about patient centricity, that we all embrace that, you know, in its entirety. Um, that we are being three-dimensional system level thinkers and recognizing that we're all part of a bigger ecosystem <clears throat> and we all play a role, you know, in solution generation towards health equity. Like that, I think would be amazing. Um, what, what would it look like for providers? I think that, you know, there would be all the things Shalini said, um, not just from the patient experience, but also in terms of care coordination, in terms of aligning incentives, simplifying, streamlining, um, and really enhancing quality and affordability overall. I, I think for the patient, it shouldn't feel like, you know, a wild river rafting ride when they're receiving a diagnosis where they're upstream without a paddle and they're just kind of swept away like they would have tools to be able to understand you know what is their disease state what are their options have choices make an informed choice you know have that be both clinically defined and financially characterized all of the things that we're missing right now from an information asymmetry standpoint um, and I think for companies and the capital markets, I would hope that in five years time, we have more examples of companies that are doing what's right being rewarded, you know, mm -hmm. that showing not yeah. only innovating in this environment, that it can be done, but that the marketplace responds. And so, you know, we, we joked at Genzyme when we helped get orphan drug legislation, working with many of our, you know, biotech colleagues, past that even though that started off with rare diseases, we ended up helping to build the specialty drug marketplace overall. In some ways, we kind of need to do that for public health companies now. Um, and so could we create that same impact movement within the life sciences? Maybe cancer is the pointy edge of the spear. I hope so. That's why I'm here at uh, ACS now and, and transitioning over to the social sector. And I think that Bright Edge can play a role there. Well, we, we certainly so. agree. <laughs> and we thank you very much. I know we're at the, the top of the hour. Um, we very much thank you for participating today. Um, yeah. Derek has put information um, about Bright Edge, um, about ACS CAN, about the forum, as well as our New York Bio Patient Engagement Summit, which is next week. Oh my gosh, it's next week. <laughs> um, and so we thank you for your time, for your contribution, and for what you do every day on behalf of cancer patients. You all are amazing. And we very much thank you for being our partners. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, so. thank you both for joining us. We really appreciate it. All right, have a great okay. day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Thank you for tuning in to New York Bio's virtual breakfast series. Join us every Tuesday at 9 a.m. 
for more discussions with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. For more information on New York Bio, please visit us at www.newyorkbio.org.